And I'm very pleased to introduce Linda May Lincoln. She's the Director of Children's Ministry at the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventists. She has served the church as an elementary teacher, college lecturer, and a departmental district director. She obtained her degree in educational psychology and counseling from Andrews University. She enjoys working with children, developing resources, and writing for the Adventist Review, Adventist World, Kids Ministry Ideas, and other churches' publications. She is married with two adult, adult sons and six grandchildren. Please welcome Lyndon. Thank you, Elizabeth. Sorry, you have to repeat <laughs> the introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, I just came up from another... Uh, I was sitting in the other one teaching children to witness, and I noticed some, several ideas from there very much related to our involving children in ministry. Can we have the PowerPoint uh, right there on the screen? And I, I think all those uh, are my PowerPoint, although not in PowerPoint form, but they are in the notes, uh, in the presenter's notes that you have in the printouts. Okay, involving children in ministry. Now, we believe that children need to be involved. If they want to be strong Christians, to feel that they are welcome in the church, that they are growing in their own uh, spiritual journey, they need to be involved. If not, they will just go to Sabbath school on, on the weekends, on Sabbath, and then go to Pathfinders maybe, or Adventurers, one of those uh, evenings, uh, or a Sunday, and that's it. I would, uh, yeah, just like all of us, the reason why I stayed in the church as a young teenager at 17 when I got baptized was immediately our pastor's wife, our teachers got us involved in ministry. I remember the first thing. Now, those days we used to have branch Sabbath schools. I don't know if you still have them. Uh, we have branch Sabbath school in many parts of the world like Philippines, India, you know, uh, Sri Lanka and all the other in Indonesian countries, they do have branch Sabbath school. Uh, it's, it's a Sabbath school program offered for the communities, but in some one of the church members' house. So we open up the home, and then we do the same thing like we do in Sabbath school. So I remember they asked me to go out and help. So we did. And we and one member out way very far out in the, uh, the mall, uh, out of the suburb area, and we run the branch Sabbath school. So that was my first experience. And then, of course, the pastor said, oh, okay, now we come, we go from door to door. I tell you, that's the most scary experience for me because I've never done that. You know? And they asked us to knock on the door, and you know, when I knock on the door, the people just open, and they see us, and they just bang it, and it's closed. And I don't want to talk to you anymore. Now, in Asia, many homes are not like American homes. Nice, the door is there. And every time you open the door and somebody rings the bell, over there, everything has bars. You know, steel bars, iron bars. And so they just poke their head out to look to see who is out there. And most of the time, they don't want to open. They look through that. And so when you knock on the door, uh, you know, it's just so scary and so frightening. But yet... Our church, you know, our pastors and all that, okay, come with us. <laughs> and we knock on the door, door. Now, we know that the entering wedge for ministry is the health message, right? So people don't want to listen to the gospel or Jesus or whatever it is, but they will talk to you about health because that's a topic that involves everyone. So I remember the first thing we did was every month we would go out from door to door and ask people if they want to join the want to uh, enroll in the Voice of Prophecy health lessons. And they will say, yes. And then we'll give them lesson one. And then next Sabbath, we'll go there and we get the lesson one. And then we give them lesson two. And then we bring it back to grade, to our Voice of Prophecy you know, teachers or leaders who, who will grade it and then answer questions. And then we'll go back again. You know, first few times, it was really scaring me. But then the next few times, we had a little bit more confidence. Okay, let's look at the next slide. Oh, do you have the... The command from Jesus is love your neighbor as yourself, right? 
That's what we are there to do as a Christian. Do unto others as, as you would like others to do to you in Luke. So therefore, we believe as Christians, we want to reach out and we want our children to be able to reach out and share and love your neighbor. Uh, it's not enough just to study. It is a memory verse, just a textbook uh, things, but we want them to be able to do so. Next slide, Leslie. Now, as the teaching by Paul, we are all members of the family, right? One body, many parts, the hand, the, you know, the foot, the eyes, the you know, ears, and we all do that. And every member has different gifts. Therefore, we want to utilize our children's spiritual gifts. Some children can sing, like this morning, those children. Now, those four in the family not only play musical instrument beautifully, they also sang beautifully. And the harmony was just lovely. You know, I, I go to Africa every year, different parts of Africa. I hear all these songs. And it's just full of interest, full of life. And, and even a two-year-old child in Africa really moved. They have the rhythm in their life in their body, and every time they sing something, they'll be moving, and they, well, maybe for me as a Chinese, I don't know how to move, you know. I remember I went to uh, Cameroon, and we had big children, and oh, everybody's, the moment music starts, they're all moving, but I'm standing there singing, okay, and then this little two-year-old beside me, he said, you're not moving, you're not moving, she said, so I said, oh, well, because I thought I was doing actions already. But she said, I'm not moving. So I wasn't sure what she meant. I wasn't moving. I said, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm doing the action. She said, no, you didn't move here, she said. And it was really funny for a two-year-old to tell me that. You know, well, it's different culture, but she has, they seem to have that gift to do that. I don't know, the Asian people don't have that gift. Maybe the Asian people only see dollar sign in their eyes and they're always making business. So that is their gift, right, maybe. So maybe they need to help contribute to the work. But our children, you see, you, we want them to be able to use the gifts because many of them have been singing gifts. Um, we have one boy I met, he, he's so good in being a ventriloquist. I think it's a skill that you have to have. You know, but he did it very well and he, he tried to use his gift in puppet ministry in, when, you know, in the work that he, he does. And, as, and he brought... You know, many kids were attracted by his, his skill. And so whenever we have ministry, like puppet ministry, we always make sure he's there in that country. So let's take a look at some of the reasons why we want to get kids. Because they're all part of the church, right? Of the, the church body. So they need to contribute and feel they are part of this church. So, so that they not only uh, watch us do it, but they also get the exit. The experience is it. You know, you always get a joy when you do something good as an adult, and children feel the same way. Oh, I can help someone, or I can go out there and do this and that. So let's take a look. Say, why get kids involved in ministry? According to uh, Jim Burns in, the book, in his book, The Youth Builder, he says, getting young people involved in mission and service is not an option for Christian growth and maturity, it is a necessity. If you want to grow spiritually, that's what it is. Let's take a look at the, uh, the next uh, one. George Barner. We know George Barner talks a lot about building faith for children and why we need it. But he also mentions the importance as part of faith building is involvement in ministry. We believe it is imperative to instill the value that a Christian is blessed, is blessed to pass on the blessing to others. And that can only be accomplished if the person is active serving other people. So the, the act of serving other people is cultivated from the earliest years. The children engage in church, church's program. Whether those forms of service are simple, visiting people in a nursing home, making birthday cards to send to sick people, earnestly praying for specific individuals, the, the, the hope is to build a habit habit that children continue to do it because you know, at first it may be just well, something exciting they come and do together because all their friends are there. But after you do more, like one writer says, if you want to raise generous adults, 
raise generous children. That's how it is. It starts with them. I remember even growing up, now my father being Chinese, you know, we are Chinese, so my father's a businessman. My father-in-law is a businessman. My grandparents, my grandfather, they're all business people, either running Chinese restaurant or doing all kinds of different kinds of businesses. And I remember when we, I was growing up, um, my father taught us what it means to be generous, to help others, even from very young age. Now, unfortunately, my mother died at the age of 29 when I was eight years old. We were on our way to Japan for a holiday that afternoon, but her heart just stopped beating. All of a sudden, and they, immediately we sent her to the hospital, and three doctors did what they could, but they couldn't save her. They opened up her heart, and they tried to pump, and those days we had no CPR or whatever it is, but they couldn't save her. And finally, in the evening, you know, she, we, she just couldn't be revived. And so, we, so I lost my mother at that very young age. And my father, having, you know, he was uh, in the chocolate business and he was in you know, restaurant and many other kinds of businesses. So, but I always remember every time, every week, uh, you know, in chocolate, uh, you always have quality control, right? Some, they are a little crooked or smashed a little bit, not meeting quality control, you have to take it take it out, and then you put the good ones into the boxes or whatever wrappers it is. So many times, my father would have bring home a big bag, a oh, fairly big bag of uh, chocolates that don't meet the quality control. And so we, and three of us, my bro younger brother and my sister, three of us, we were always, my dad would ask us to pack it into little boxes, uh, little uh, plastic uh, bags, tie a ribbon, and then he would drive us around the neighborhood, you know, around our neighborhood, there were some poor families or kids, and then we would pass them out. It has always been that way. But you see, my father didn't remarry until six years later. He was mourning the sudden death of my mom, and so, and by the time he got married, we were teenagers. It was hard to adjust to a stepmother, but my stepmother came into the home with very different concept and view because she was the only child in a family. For me, I think she was very spoiled. Anyway, she came in and married my dad, and that's when we always quarrel on Sabbath over the chocolates because my stepmother felt that my father should not distribute them always. Bring it to Chinatown and sell them. Some shopkeepers would buy it. And so every time my stepmother said, nope, then she would tell us, don't pack. So we stopped. My dad said, no, don't listen to your pack. And so we will be packing. And then after that, my stepmother said, don't pack it. We want to sell them. And then my dad would tell us, no, don't listen to her. You just pack. And so we used to wonder, what's going on? But then, of course, finally, my dad, being the, the man of the family, he said, I am the boss. You don't tell me not to give. So we would be packing, and as I grew up, I always remember whether it's Christmas, Chinese New Year, Indian Deepavali or New Year, uh, uh, Malay, you know, Hari Raya, Haji, whatever celebration, my father would always ask us to wrap presents, and we would go and give to our... You know, we have a driver at home, but my father would drive the car himself, and we would go and give gifts to our driver, our gardener, our, you know... It's like my stepmother didn't think we need to do that. You know, it was a different concept. But fortunately, her, she has three other ch she had three children of her own. So I have three half brothers and sisters. So six of us in the family. But I'm grateful all three of her children learned the model that my dad has given us. And they just go out and always help. You know, oftentimes my stepmother will be grumbling and they'll tell her mother, you don't be selfish. You know. Why? Because it was an opportunity that they have witnessed and they found the joy when they went out with us. Every Christmas, we'll be doing that. And that's why George Barna say it's, it's important to build a habit as a child so that you can go. Very early, Ellen G. White tells us, very early, the lesson of helpfulness should be taught the child. He should be encouraged, he or she should be encouraged in trying to help father and mother encourage to deny and to control himself, to put others' happiness and convenience before his own, 
to watch for opportunities, to cheer and assist brothers and sisters and playmates, and to show kindness to the aged, the aged, the sick, and the, the unfortunate. The more fully the spirit of true ministry per, pervades the home, the more fully it will be developed in, this, in the lives of the children. They will learn to find joy in service and sacrifice for the good of others. You know, this last few weeks, we are asked to donate money left and right. The, it started with Houston, with the you know, terrible uh, hurricane. And then next comes the next hurricane, uh, Puerto Rico and Dominican and Mexico and an earthquake and, and all those things left and right. We were asked, our church, Edra asked us, and then the ACS of North American Division. And so we were all donating. It was, but it was a joy, right? Even though we, we may not contribute thousands of dollars, but whatever we could is what comes as far as service is concerned. So why gets kids involved in ministry? Let's take a look at some of those really good reasons. It's because it's a great opportunity to put the growing faith into action. That's what it means to love your neighbor, to do this, do for free. You know, for children growing up here in the U.S., we always encourage them to work for something, right? I like that attitude. I like that because in the Far East, we don't do that. Every time they ask for something, we just buy for them or we ask them to save the money. But here in America, they learn to be independent. They go out there and work and, and raise funds or do whatever it is to buy whatever they need or want to have, which is a, a good idea, good opportunity to... So we also want them not just to think of themselves, but to think of others, to, raise, to have that growing faith in action. Because if you love, if Jesus said, love your neighbor, you know, I always am grateful when my children went to school at Ruth Murdoch Elementary School in Andrews. Uh, my oldest son's th third grade teacher. Every day in the Bible study, after that, she would send a letter home to us as parents. And we would read and say, oh, this week we have been studying about the Good Samaritan. Can you talk over with your child to see how he can be a Good Samaritan this week? So I would talk with my son and say, what do you want to do? And he and his friends. And so they say, okay, we'll help the neighbor next door. And so they go over and they want to help paint his fans, uh, mow the lawn for them, an uh, old couple. <laughs> and, and in fact, the, the old couple, let's call him Mr. Brown, he said, well, you're coming to help me? That's great. He said, but how much are you charging? You know. Because most kids come by and ask for jobs in the summer, but you pay them, right? It's not free. You know? And so he asked them, so how much are you charging me for mowing the lawn? Because four guys got together, and they're in the third grade, and painting his fence. And so they said, oh, it's free. You know, he didn't believe it. It's free? Well, we, are one, we want to be a good Samaritan. That's what they told him. And he was so happy. So when they finished the job, he said, would you come again next month to be a good Samaritan? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, of course, they went back to the class and they reported to their teachers what they could do and what should be, you know, what they... And the teacher asked them, so how did you feel? What was it? And, you know, they were giving their reactions. And, and then the next question, my son came home and asked, Mommy, next month he wants us to go and help him again because it's free, he said. So I asked him, would you like to do that free for them? Why not? Because they are elderly and maybe it's good to help. He said, but no pay, he said. I said, well, it's good to do a project for free even though it means no pay. He said, yeah, I'll talk to my friends about it, he said. Now, those four friends have grown up together from grade one, and they call themselves the Four Musketeers. And they did many things together. They joined Pathfinders. And those days, there was no adventurers, so they just joined Pathfinders, and they did all those. And so they talked about it, and they came back, and she told I said, what's the verdict? Well, our friends say, okay, other, ones, other jobs we do will ask for pay, but this one, <laughs> we will do it for free. I said, being a good Samaritan doesn't mean only one week. Every day of your life, I said. So it's an opportunity. And I'm grateful today my children, my both my sons are in the 40s. But 
they are still in the church. I said, thank God they're raising their kids to help them to do the same thing because they have watched it. It has given them a satisfaction. Okay, develop empathy for others. What does it say in the next slide? It develop an empathy. They understand what it is like when people have no food. And see, most of the time we watch the television, we don't really know what it means that when someone really don't have anything. I just read in the review, I think that day they announced in our ECOM, uh, oh no, at the annual council last week that the Redwood Academy or something right here was completely burned and destroyed by the fire. That was really shocking. I mean, you know, and, and I called and then I told my son. Now, my older son lives in Seattle, which is not too far. I'm sure he saw that in the news. But whether it's academy he saw, I do not know because I didn't see that in the, acad I mean, the academy situation. But he told me, and it's funny, my grandkids, they, oh, what are, then what are the kids going to do? You see, that was their first thought, you know. What are the kids going to do? No classroom and, you know. So these are things that having an empathy to understand, not just sympathize with them, to feel like they feel. So a great opportunity, the next one, to introduce children and teens to the wonderful world of giving. Giving of what? Not just money, the time. Volunteering their time to do something, their talents, their treasures. You know, I remember when the tsunami hit Southeast Asia in Indonesia. That was the first time that so many of us in the world were not even aware of and not prepared for it. And so many hundreds of people really perished and died. And I remember Adra was out there immediately. Adra, Indonesia, Adra from our headquarters. And I remember they asked many of our churches, can you help pack all these boxes of uh, dried food and things like that, and then toiletries and, and things in all the shoe boxes and all the boxes, and they asked some of our churches, please do that. So we did. We got a kid together. You know, it's amazing. The children come to church in the morning at 7.30 on Sunday morning. I don't know how many of us get out at 7.30 on Sunday morning. And they were there waiting, and the leaders have not arrived yet. And they're wondering, well, we're supposed to pack and do all these things to help those victims of the tsunami. And they were there. So I saw many big churches. They were gathering. Well, my little church is the small one, but still, the kids came together and did that. It was a wonderful time to give their time, you know, their money. They may not have a whole lot of money, but they're giving their time to pack things to see what they can do to develop, to help somebody in need. So that is a really value. Those values we cannot learn in the classroom or in the books unless we ourselves practice it. Okay, let's take a look at other reasons. It builds positive relationships with adults and with peers. We build a relationship because we are doing together, side by side, getting out there. We become empowered to make a difference in the world. You know, I went to one children's congress and the theme was, I can make a difference. And the whole theme, everything around it, whether it was the activities, whether it was the, you know, a song. They even developed a special song. You know, and all the kids, I heard 500 over kids singing, I can make a difference at home and in school. And all the, everyone was singing, they can make a difference in the world with the little thing that they do. And also the next reason is they feel valued within the church family and realize that they can be used by God for his purposes. So they feel valued because everyone has different gifts. And the ones who are not so good in packing, maybe they're good enough. Now, right now, our church joined some kind of food bank that every month we have to pack food for the poor children in certain public schools. So we got involved with that. And it's great. All the people come together, the children, the teenagers, and, and, and young people, and even the older ones who can, who's healthy enough to help pack because they feel that the church look at them and say, hey, you play an important role here. You know, not just uh, all of us who, they always call us, the, the adult members are the ones who come in coat and tie. Every Sabbath is coat and tie, you know. So only those people go up to the stage, the coat and tie people. So it is different. Now, at least in America, we allow women. In some places, 
They don't allow women to get up to the stage. And it is very interesting to know in Africa, in many places, uh, they, don't, they don't like women to be on the stage. But yet we want them to feel that, hey, female, male, young and old, we are part of this important role. of it. Now, The next, uh, why get another reason? Discover the plan and purpose God has for their lives. You know, I have seen children, young people go out as student missionary for one year. They discover what God wants them to do because they went out for mission. They went out for service. You know, I belonged, for years, I worked in my own division, Southern Asia Pacific Division. And we had Guam Micronesia mission for the last 20 years. And for year after year, we tried to ask North America to take it back. <laughs> they said, no, no, no. So nobody wanted it. So I don't know how Guam Micronesia got into our Asian territory. So it was passed to us. So it was in my... My, my work. So I go out there and I see, do you know we have many Adventist schools in Guam, Micronesia, on all the little islands. If I didn't work in that division, I have never heard of these islands in my life. Yap, the only island that has a lot of people, women walking around with top, is topless. And we have women, we have Yap, Ibai, Kwajalein, Saipan, we probably heard Saipan more than any other places. Ponape, Chuk. I said, where do all these, <laughs> where are these islands? Are? And yet they are full of people. And, and we have so many schools. Who runs them? Student missionaries. If we didn't have student missionaries who come out for one year of mission or service, I don't think we, we have to close all our schools. That's why every year we get nervous when the government does not approve. But I look at these student missionaries, First year, second year, sophomore, some of them junior maybe, another one is a freshman. Said, what, what do they know? They are so inexperienced. And they're going out there to teach kids. But let me tell you, those young people who go out there come back a transformed person. Because that year of mission has helped them to discover what their skills are, what their gifts are, but how does God want them to do? When they come back to school, what are they going to do? Just finish a degree and earn more money? Or what is it? What is their, their goal? And recognizing. So that's why I'm grateful. And it's really funny that on all those islands, our Adventist schools are the best schools. And even government officials send their children to our school. Run by not professional teachers you know not qualified already. Of course, the principal is. But other than that, student missionary. And I'm just wondering, I used to ask the question, I say, student missionaries, you know, are they teaching the right thing? Well, God puts them there and they're willing to come for that ministry, you know, service. And so they discover what God wants them to do. Okay, the next reason is, another good reason to involve kids is understand that Christ calls us to a lifestyle of servanthood and a heart for mission. I think God has a heart for mission and therefore helping us realize you know, that lifestyle of serving, uh, the humility, not always wanting. But I have seen ch young people who come from a very wealthy home. They come out here. You know, I, I went to uh, Spencerville Church one day and I heard this group of young people just went out for missionary, a student missionary work or mission pr uh, a trip down to Guatemala. And they came back and there were two young men who stood up there and gave a testimony to the whole church. And this young person said, I don't think I did anything spectacular, he said. But I just went there to conduct song service, play my guitar and lead the children in singing, he said in worship. He said, but it has changed my life, he said. When I saw what the children don't have that I have in my home, he said, I'm, I have decided next year I'm going again, whichever country they're going on a trip, but I'm going to take all the things that I don't need and I'm going to bring it with me for a mission trip. I said, amen. And, and this young boy was only 14. 
and he went with his teachers and uh, church members, and he understand what it means to serve. See? Servanthood is something, you know, today every time I read those books in the, in the bookstore, how to get rich in 100 days, uh, how to, you know, do all this, it's like everything is for myself rather than for others. See, so the mission, the concept of service is so lacking. Sometimes I look at the, at the news and I see every time the politicians are arguing about this or whatever it is, you know, they're always, and, and I look at Africa, whenever there's an there's a election, there's always protests after the election. There's corruption, there's problems with that. We want our young people to learn. And they can also learn valuable life lessons that cannot be learned in the textbook. Because it's life itself. And we have given them an opportunity to be able to, to do such things. Okay, another reason is we introduce children to community service by starting at home. We need to introduce them. Don't just go a mission trip if at home they are not happy or they're lazy or they don't want even to help in the home. Then we have really failed. <laughs> we need to start them young. Ellen White said, help at home first. Brothers and sisters helping to do chores. I remember when, now I don't have daughters. I always wanted daughters, but in my Coe's family, my father-in-law has 16 grandsons and no granddaughter. Even with twins and, you know, all my sisters-in-law, they have twins, everyone. So when we get together for birthday, we have 16 boys running around, no girls. So, of course, when I raise my boys, I have to teach them to help in the home, wash dishes. So one day, when my son was a little younger, he came and said, the two of them said, Mommy, can we have a baby brother, a baby sister? He said, I said, no, because in Singapore, that those days, it was a law that we can only have two, just like China has one child policy. Because we have overpopulation, so the government said, two is enough. Because if I have the third child, I'll get fined, and then my third child cannot go to the kind of schools that, because the island is getting too small for it. So I told my sons, I said, no, I don't think mommy can have another one. But I said, why a baby sister? Maybe the third one looking at your co or your cousins? I said, probably another boy, right? No, we don't want, we only want baby sister. I said, why? So that the baby sister can help us wash dishes and clean the rooms, they said. So I said, where do you get the idea that only girls do that? And then my, my son took this Bible and said, Eve sinned first, he said. I said, where do you get that theology? <laughs> and well, he sinned first, but what, what does it have to do with it? He said, oh, he said, that's why a woman has to do the work. I said, oh, oh, you got it all wrong, I said. <laughs> so we usually try to train them to clean the toilets and you know, take care of household chores. There's part of something that we start with service in the home. See, if you can't help one another and help your parents, it's hard to help somebody else. See, so it's good to get them involved first. And also, it, uh, the next reason is it teaches children to develop sensitivity to family members. And when dad or mom has a tough day, they immediately come, you know, because they need a little loving, tender care, right? So that helps when each other, you know. And it was funny thing, one day I remember after a few years later, my, they were always used to washing dishes. And, and my son, my older son loves basketball, baseball, football, whatever, foot, whatever ball uh, game, you know, he's in there. So we were still in Andrews and, and now in the little apartment, his friends were calling for him. Come on, Terrence, it's time for basketball. <laughs> and he's washing dishes. You have to wait. I have to help finish dishes. And his friends were all jeering. Why are you washing dishes? The guys, why are you washing dishes? You should be down there. My mother says, so I can help my wife. And when I grow up, I say, oh my. <laughs> and the next day, uh, those boys, his friends, their, their mothers came and said, what have you been doing to train your, <laughs> your son to, to, I mean, to do help household chores so that next time he will help his wife. I said, I certainly hope he will help his wife, but that's not what I told him. I said, what I want him to do is to be part of the family, to, to shoulder responsibility so that we can so do that. Then he can move out and help other people in the community. And another good reason, encourage sharing, taking turns, and, and the importance of respecting each other. You know, sometimes I see some siblings fighting away. 
you know, not respecting each other. Praising and rewarding this action will establish a foundation for future broader efforts. So this is good for them to learn to share and love each other and help each other. And then they move out to help other family members, relatives, and then non non I mean non-members, strangers that they don't even know. You know, I always remember when we brought our Sabbath school kids out to the railroad tracks to help those children who live under the bridge and then just by the railroad track and their homes are just cartons, uh, paper boxes where you put refrigerators that you buy, you take them and throw them, they make it into a home. And when the typhoon comes, everything collapses. And so we brought our children from the Sabbath school out there to help, to pass out things, give their, their toys and books that you, they, you know, they can share and brought clothes and, you know, after they come back, I could tell that that sharing has done a great deal for them. They come back and they all started pulling out the things from their homes. And I, was, I went home and asked my son, what are you doing in your room? Pulling out all the clothes that he said, he said oh, this I don't wear anymore. You know, for our children, usually even if they don't play with a toy anymore for many, a few years, a few months, but the moment you take them out and want to give away, what happened? No, 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 no. I still want that. And they never touch it for how many years? They never saw it. But the moment you pull them out and you want to use for garage sale or donate to Value Village or whatever it is, they immediately stop. And they'll ask, no, 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 don't give it away. Don't give it away. But now I see my son pulling out all these things. I said, what are you doing, Terrence? And my younger son, Marvin, said, we're giving it to those people, those kids at the railroad track, he said. So they were pulling out all those things and uh, trying to put them so that they can give them away. So I said, what about... And then he pulled out one very special gift that he had for birthday. Not open yet. And he wanted that for a long time. So he's sitting there thinking. So Marvin, my younger son, said, you want to give that? And he said, well, I, I waited a long time to get this from Grandpa. He said... But then Marvin said, you give it and then ask again, he said. <laughs> you know, but it was hard for him to give a gift away that he wanted that particular toy. And so he said, okay, let's do that. <laughs> so I said, well, I said, you pray about it and see what Jesus tells you, I said. And then later on with all his friends, okay, then I saw that new box of toy. I was surprised. I didn't say anything. But when I saw it later on, I said, I see your, you have such a generous heart. He said, yeah, we prayed. Marvin and I prayed. So it somehow I feel better when I give that away, he said. I said, that's wonderful if you're able to do that. It's not easy, but helping children, you know, involves teaching a little bit by showing our example. Because like the, the, all, the, all the leading family therapists or psychologists will tell you, if you want to teach all these values, you have to be beside them to show you. Don't just tell them you need to be kind. And I never forget when, after my kids grew up, uh, we still have that one, once a month, rent a bus, and we bring all the young people and the members, go from door to door to knock and ask people to take health lessons. And every week, now, I've been longer in the church now after being baptized. And so I send my kids to, ch to the church. And my friends did the same. And one day I dropped them at church so that they can have the experience of witnessing and sharing, ministering. And then my son, as he closed the door, he said, Mommy, why are all the mommies and daddies sleeping in the afternoon on Sabbath and just drop us to go? <laughs> I said, he said, all of you will sleep till Jesus comes, he said. You know, when I heard that, it really blow, hit my mind. So I went home and I told my husband, I said, looks like we're not really exemplifying the right thing that we're teaching. We want our kids to grow in spiritual journey, but yet we never come with them. Because I felt like I've had enough experience, right? 30 some years or 40 years in the church. And so we sent them. So I went and told all my friends who sent their kids just like we did. Because we live on an academic campus. So 
I said, you know, that's what my son says, that we never go with them. We go home and sleep. So my husband decided, okay. Now, most men after lunch usually need a nap. Maybe only my husband does, I don't know. But anyway, so we decided, okay, let's... So we decided we would just... He would take a 15-minute cat nap or whatever you call it. And then we get together and go with them. You know, I could see that they <laughs> become very excited when all these parents start going. And you know, when he grew up, a few years later, he came to tell me one day. He said, Mommy, I just made a new discovery. He said, those days when you sent us, we were doing lay activities, right? The layman. He said, now I understand. Those days you guys were laying on the bed every Sabbath sleeping through and not being involved in ministry and service. That's why today our Adventist church has changed the name, he said. It's no more lay activities. It's personal ministry, he said. <laughs> you know, I look at it, I said, I said, where do you find that out? He said, oh, we all talk about it in the school. <laughs> and even young people realize that for a long time we were laying down, I suppose. Maybe the word laity is very good, but not lay activities, maybe. And so that we, we have to get together with them. Because when you want to make disciples, you have to be alongside the disciple to go with them, not just tell them how to do it. And another reason is, we look at some of those many reasons, community involvement needs to evolve as a natural process of family growth and values. It's not something, okay, you learn this and you do this and then that's it. Say, I have to be part of that process. The whole family growing together, growing outreach. And parents must decide if they want to support their children's independent efforts or work alongside them. Now, you have to make the decision because if you just want to send them, too many times our parents today have the drop-off mentality, right? I just drop you off at VBS, I drop you off here, I drop you off to go and do some good deed. Then I don't need it because I've had lots of experiences already in my life or in my own spiritual growth. But that's not enough. Our young people are watching us all the time. And if we don't come out and help them and do that alongside with them, you know, they're not seeing us even putting our faith into action. So meet, come out with them. Families can cooperate together in such a worthwhile activity as a, as, a, as a town or beach cleanup or doing things. You know, I can see that young people get so inspired and they're motivated because the adults came along. The elders dress in jeans and come and help. Now, once, a, uh, once every five months, we have a church cleanup. We thoroughly clean up from the garage to everything and clean our, wipe our pews and, you know, do all those things. And so everybody comes out, young and old. And we try to encourage everyone. To, and after that, we had a good meal and enjoy together. And it was always such a great joy to see the young people, even the children. What, are, what can the little kid do anyway? I mean, they can climb up and kneel, but at least they can wipe the pews. So they would use their little wet cloth or to polish or do things like that. That would be very helpful, which is part of the experience, right? Now, what, what are some of the ideas that can involve kids in ministry? Uh, let's take a look just uh, quickly. A mission to the elderly, rest homes, convalescent home hospitals. Here you have many kinds in America. Uh, assisted living and all the different types that we go and bring kids to sing. Uh, we, we used to call our group, we used to call these groups sunshine bands. I don't know. Uh, in Asia, we always call them sunshine bands. And then we would bring them to, to sing, to play. And we even ask the children to pray. I've seen this happening in many parts of the world. Uh, even in uh, Africa, children go out there and really minister and they find the joy. When I was in Cameroon, I remember after the program, the children got together and said, can you come with us to the hospital? And we did. And uh, we all went together with the directors. And I said, what do you do? He said, once a month, uh, we go to the hospital and sing and pray for them. Now, remember, 
uh, Cameroon is a country about 90% or so of Muslim believers. And they're a very small number of Christians. And so these Adventists, get, and they put a little bit of money together and buy a big bunch of bananas, huge combs, and they bring it there. And then they go from bed to bed and sing to the people. And they ask them, can we pray for you? And the children pray. And when they say yes, they will. Most of the time, the Muslims say yes, do pray for us. And they will pray. And then they distribute one banana, you know, to the patient. Sometimes the relatives who are there would ask for another banana. So they would give it away. And then they would pray for them and they move on. And I said, how long have you been doing that? Oh, we have done this for the last three years. And the children, they're not very wealthy, but they put together a little bit of money. And, and with the help of the leaders, they go. But they found the joy of just ministering, you know, service to these people. We never know how many of you will, how many of them will become Seventh-day Adventists. But we need to get rid of the idea that every time we do ministry and service to people, we want to make sure they're baptized. That's not our, you know, baptism and conversion is the work of the Holy Spirit. Most important is we go out there and share and sow the seeds and help them to know about Jesus, the love, through our love. See, not just because if they stop becoming Adventists or not interested in being a Christian, then we drop them and don't visit anymore. We should continue to help in spite of that. So that's why adopt a grandparent program. Sometimes it's quite popular in some places. They adopt a grandparent sometimes from another country or, you know, some older folks. And, and number two, prayer ministry. See, prayer ministry is really wonderful. You know, I always think, I used to think children just mimic the prayers that we teach them. But I have, in my, in my experience of work this in the last 10 years, I have seen children as really prayer warriors. They pray so earnestly. Uh, like in Korea, every year they have a prayer conference. Uh, in Philippines, many parts they have prayer conferences where they get the kids together to learn to pray. And I go to Bangladesh. Bangladesh is Muslim and a small, amount, a small number of Adventists. But our director there started a prayer, prayer meeting. If we can get adults to come for a prayer meeting on a Wednesday night, we say hallelujah. But not too many. Many churches don't even run... We, I mean, midweek prayer meetings anymore. But yet, children come for prayer meetings. Now, they don't go there to listen to a sermon. Prayer, mean, prayer meeting means we get together and pray. And they come. Some of them still with uniform from school, but they go there to pray for half an hour. They pray for their friends, pray for children of the world, pray for whoever, whatever it is. And they are encouraged to join these prayer groups. It's really interesting. I saw in Bangladesh, in Dhaka itself, uh, the children came. At first, only two. Then gradually improved, increased until 30 kids come every week just to pray. And then pretty soon, their parents also come with them because they want to make sure they are safe. And so the parents came. And so finally, the pastor said, if the parents come with the kids, why don't we have the adult prayer meeting? Because they didn't have one because nobody came except the pastor and his wife. And so pretty soon they, they were having adults, and the children continue. It's just wonderful, you know, when I saw that, it just brought tears to my eyes to see that if children can teach us, no wonder Pastor Roja said what? Teachable, right? have a teachable spirit. So we have to learn like children. They're encouraged to join. A mission to the sick, of course, all those, we know that oftentimes we have encouraged them to run, you know, to help write cards and and I feel that uh, United, uh, your North American division has a very good ministry, which I was trying to introduce to the other parts of the world, is ministry to kids whose parents are in prison or incarcerated. You know, there are many children who are left out there where both parents are in jail or one maybe. And we help, we want our kids to befriend them, to work with them. And I know in NAD, you know, they have this very good ministry. So I was encouraging my directors around the world Go out there and work with them because there are many prison ministries uh, going on, done by women ministry. They would reach out to the prisoners. But we need to help them get our kids there to work with those children whose parents are away and give them encouragement and help them. A teaching ministry, maybe that's good to have children who are gifted to learn to teach lesson. 
You know, I saw a young child teaching Sabbath school lesson to the, you know, the teenagers teaching teenagers. And just like they preach on Sabbath, and uh, child preachers are in many, many places, and they're so dynamic. It's amazed me. The youngest child preachers I've seen is six years old, and I believe he's gifted by God. Not every child can preach. And he's so gifted, this little John Cox, you know, it's really interesting. We had an evangelistic meeting, and we chose five kids to be child preachers every night for 10 nights. So we rented, I, I rented a hall in uh, Silang where our division office is in the little town. And then we used the hall every night. And John Cox, the little fellow, so short, but he would stand up on a chair on the pulpit because he was too short. And he preached his heart out. And he's looking at his audience, you know, and he preached. And they have been taught... Um, they have a program called Little Trumpets where we train the children, those who have the gift and who love to preach, how to preach. And they choose their favorite Bible text and they talk three points on the text itself. So he chose John 3.16. And so he was preaching and preaching. And then he looked at it and said, Daddies and mommies, those of you over there sleeping, open your eyes. Because Jesus, God loves you. His text was John 3.16. And it was really interesting to see how much aware he was to keep in contact with his audience. And it's, it's amazing, you know. Some of them have the gift, so we need to train them. Train them to be future Sabbath school leaders. Let's see. I have to end soon. But let's finish up some of these other... A mission to the hungry... You know, one, one uh, family that I have uh, seen, that I have come acquainted with was in Pennsylvania, an African family from Kenya. The three sons, you know, they came here and they wanted to help because many p kids, many kids became orphans in Africa because their parents died of HIV AIDS. And it's not just non Adventist, Adventist family too. And so these three brothers, they felt they need to do something because so many of their cousins have become orphans. So they wanted to help build an orphanage. So what did they do? They, they decided to raise funds. So they went and picked up all the, uh, you know, the seven up pop drink can that people throw away, we use for recycle, whatever. They collected all the, those days there was no recycle when I first moved here. And they collected hundreds and hundreds of them. Every day after school, they collected them and then put it. And then their father would try to bring it to their company. And then they get paid for the every, I don't know one, how many cents they get for each candy. And pretty soon, the church got involved because they didn't have a big van to carry and lug all these bags of uh, pop cans, so pop drink cans. So they took them and the members used their trucks and they... You know, they raised $10,000. Now, when I first came to U.S. to work, the first thing I saw on the TV was this news. Surprised me. Because it was the news that showed three young men, 10, 12, and 14. And they, and they, were, just read, they were reading a citation from the mayor for the good work of these three young men. And so I was wondering, and I was surprised. So I was, I, well, as long as children, I wanted to see. And then they mentioned three young men from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I was amazed when I saw that. I said, wow. And they mentioned this Fulton, uh, Pennsylvania. And so he said, they have raised $10,000 to build an orphanage in their little village back home in, in Kenya for the orphans, the HIV orphans. And so the... Uh, and what they did and how innovative the idea was that the mayor gave them a citation. And somebody heard about it. So some rich person saw the news and heard about it. They gave them the air ticket so that when they finished building, they finished building the orphanage, they went there to see the orphanage. And it was a wonderful experience for these three brothers, twin brothers and one younger one. Now, their father came to U.S. to study his Ph.D. in Pennsylvania. And so they were going to school, but they wanted to reach out. And that was a great thing. So some of these ideas, you know, mission to families, to, you know, it's important that families need to work side by side to inspire them. George Banner tells us in the last, uh, oh, we will just flip through those. I'll leave you to read your own notes and that. Family involvement, he says that in 
In addition to the personal service expectations, many of the effective churches try to reinforce the importance of outreach efforts by setting up opportunities for families to work together in serving needy children. And they have discovered that once parents recognize their obligation to direct the spiritual development of their children and recognize how an integral serving others is in the journey, they are so open to serving alongside their youngsters in a meaningful way. So may God bless us as we leaders go out there and encourage, not just encourage families, get your families to come along, get mothers to come and help you with your VBS, uh, whatever programs we have, you know, and bring them and be alongside them in order to help them realize. And finally, Ellen G. White tells us in her morning devotional book that I may know him, whole armies of children may come under Christ's banner as missionaries, even in their childhood years, never repulse the desire of children to do something for Jesus and never quench their ardor for working in some ways for the master. So may God bless us and, and Hebrews remind us in the last slide, do not forget to do good and to share with others for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. And so may God, and Richard, I want to thank you really on behalf of the World Church, all what you are doing. You know, all of these are volunteer work working for children. You don't get paid, but yet you have given your time your ten, in order to instill in those children that wonderful value of just getting involved out there. And, and pretty soon, if you raise, you know, kind and generous and uh, children who love to minister and serve, you will have kind and loving, generous serving adults. There's no need to even worry about the adults because you train them well from young. So may God bless each of you as you continue with your, your ministry and work. Now my turn, my children have grown. So it's my turn to influence my grandchildren to have an opportunity. So every year I see them, you know, several times a year, but Christmas is the time we get together. So I usually tell my son, well, when we come at Christmas, let's have a project. We need to get out there as a family to do something to help those people. Because if we don't, then our children become too inward and, you know, become a self-centered person rather than reaching out to make a big difference in the life of someone else. Thank you.